Hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're based in the world. Um, so welcome to today's webinar, which is Business Intelligence Development Using SQL Developer Tools. In this webinar today, which is going to consist mostly of software demonstrations, which will probably last about 30 minutes, followed by around 30 minutes of Q&A, um, we will see how you can use SQL Developer Tools to build business intelligence applications. My name is Michael Francis and I work here in the SQL Tools division at Redgate Software. Um, so before I hand over to today's presenters, who are Naomi Marino, who's a business intelligence developer at Redgate Software, and Tom Austin, who's in the SQL Tools division, also at Redgate Software, there is a small housekeeping item to explain. Um, so in order to provide a clear audio line, everybody's going to be on mute until the end um, for the whole presentation. However, we do welcome all questions, so if you do have a question, please type it into your GoToMeeting panel, and then at the end of the um, software demonstrations, we will read out all of the questions and answer them accordingly. So, so just to reiterate, we do welcome all questions, so please do type them into the GoToMeeting panel. So with no further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Tom and Naomi, who will show you um, some ways with business intelligence applications. Excellent. Hello, thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. Hi, Naomi. Um, so, uh, for a while now, we've been thinking a lot about business intelligence development and how we can do something to help BI developers, as we do for our SQL developers. And when we had the opportunity to present uh, the webinar to you today, we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to explore this area uh, a little bit further and see what some of the options are. Um, so when it comes to business intelligence development on a Microsoft platform, the tool set is reasonably limited. Uh, this is not to say that it's a poor tool set, uh, it's just that we've come to the point where we accept what is available and have to get on with what we have to get on, get done. Um, the, the typical business intelligence developer will make use of BIDS, Business Intelligence Development Studio, uh, for their day-to-day work, but we don't feel that the software to support this role should stop there. In fact, uh, we feel that there are numerous areas where the benefits traditionally enjoyed by SQL developers could be applied to a business intelligence field. Um, and today, what, what we're going to do is look through a, a bit of an example of a typical BI task. So in this case, it's actually going to be a, a new ETL task and see how we can apply some of those tools uh, actually to, to this uh, methodology to this way of working and how we can help the BI developers. Um, so Naomi, do you want to tell us a little bit about what uh, what we're actually going to be doing today? Yes. Hi Tom. Uh, so thanks Tom. Hi everyone. Um, so today we're going to be covering a small and um, a very simple BI task um, that will create a small um, data mart. So basically we'll um, gather the information from the database and move it into um, a small data warehouse or would be outside of the scope of this uh, presentation, but eventually we'll build um, a cube on top of that data map. Now, before we continue with the example, two things that I would like to mention um, as notes. So, for example, the, the, we will be using the star scheme approach. Um, I know that some people are very in favor of the uh, snowflake um, approach, but for this example, we'll use the star schema, and also we'll be using the Adventure Web database as our staging database. Now, let's see what I mean by those two things. The first one is, I know that um, there's a whole debate about which of the two um, approaches are uh, better. I guess it, it all depends. You can have a star schema, you can have a snowflake schema, you can have hybrids or mix and match. It depends what the data you have and what, um, how you want to move forward into the future, how you want to maintain it in the people layer, or you want to maintain it in the um, analysis services layer. So, um, and as you know, the BI system, um, so we have a lot of different sources. I don't know if you can see my mouse, I hope you do, but if not, uh, on the left hand side of the screen, you can see all of the different data sources. We could have MySQL, we could have Oracle, we could have flat files, we could have Excel files, um, and normally we would use, um, I've lost my mouse, oh, uh, we would use an integration services pack, which would take that information that comes from those data sources into our staging database. Now, in our staging database, uh, normally um, we'll have all of the data but coming straight away from the other one, so we would have no format, it would not be in the format that we needed for our queue. Um, and the reason for that is that we may have different times during the day that that data comes in. It could be some of them can come every five minutes, some of them could come every month, some of them could come from a web service. So, 
um, to avoid collapsing on, on, on the data coming in at different speeds, that's what we have the staging. Now, if we move it to the data warehouse, again, we use an integration services package, um, and then we transform it into that data map uh, that our cube is going to be sitting on top. Now, oops, sorry, a lot of pages in here. Uh, now, for our example, so on our example, the first thing we need to do is we go down to our customers and our clients and or our board line manager, whoever uh, needs some analytical information to be um, available. Uh, the first thing we ask them is what information they would like to see and how they would like to slice that information. So in the example today, uh, we're going to build that data map that covers the total amount of money uh, made in orders, the number of orders and the number of uh, items in order, and then also we'd like to be able to slice that information by uh, the uh, shipping country, the date of where the order, when the order was placed, the product category, the product salespeople, and the sales territory. So now having that information, we're ready to start um, our example. So Tom, I think you can enlighten us with the next step we need to take. Hello? Ooh, Tom is gone. Tom! Well, very nice. I think Tom is gone, so I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to be doing his part. Um, I don't know where he's gone, sorry. Um, so what we'll see today, um, we're going to cover uh, five different areas. Discoverability, versioning, coding, visibility, and deployment. Um, in this particular section, um, sorry, this part normally Tom is the one that will cover those. So, uh, hey, no, I'm, 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 I'm back now. Oh, there you go. Hey, you <laughs> Sorry, a, a temporary loss of connection there. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how much of it I missed, but um, I, it was certainly uh, great to see exactly what um, what we were looking at. Um, so at the moment, uh, we were looking at the uh, summary. I mean, the thing that we're going to see today, the discoverability, I was attempting to explain that. I am not as good as, good as you are, Tom. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Well, 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 thanks for helping me out until I was uh, was back online there. Um, so, as Naomi uh, started telling you, there's um, there's really five main areas that uh, we hope to show you that SQL Developer Tools can be of benefit to BI uh, developers. Uh, these are discoverability, versioning, coding, visibility, and deployment. Uh, so, we'll go through these uh, one by one and see a little bit more about exactly what we mean by this. So, um, so let's start off at the top with discoverability. Um, so by this we mean actually being able to discover the way information is linked in our database. Uh, we need to be able to understand the objects in the database along with the relationships between them to be able to effectively create our solution. Um, now with some databases this can be achieved by simply reviewing the object explorer, uh, but that's not always the case. In fact, um, when we got together and, and started putting together this presentation, uh, we decided to use the AdventureWorks database as we felt that this would be a reasonably familiar starting point and uh, something that, that most people have had a play with or a look at at some point. Uh, but it was actually really tough to, to work our way through. And as we began to work through the example, we quickly discovered that AdventureWorks was not as clear as we had first expected, and in fact it was quite difficult to track foreign key relationships through the various tables to get to the information that we required. Um, so what we needed was a way to, to get a quick overview of the database, and then after that to actually drill down into the actual relationships. And these are types of problems that actually we can address quite easily with one of our, our SQL developer tools, SQL Dependency Tracker. Um, and, and also in some parts SQL search as well, but for now we'll focus on, on SQL Dependency Tracker, which is a, uh, a tool that allows us to graphically um, view our database and the objects and the relationships between them. So it makes it a, a great choice for, first of all, a high-level overview, and then to actually drill down into, into the actual relationships themselves. Uh, so, Naomi, do you, want to, um, do you want to show us how it works and take us right into the... The database. Happy to. Thank you, Tom. Yes. So, if I'm sorry, I'm going to move away from the presentation. I'm going to go to my C. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do. So, as you know, in a business intelligence and scenario, when you're trying to find out all of that information, you receive a lot of queries, a lot of um, tables. Some people tell you, "Oh, yeah, I use this to find information," but at the end of the day, you end up having a whole set of queries. And you're not sure what tables they belong to, how is their relationship, what is the foreign key relation. So we're going to use uh, dependency tracker to help us doing that. So the first thing that we need to do is add 
that project uh, a project into a dependency um, also, sorry to dependency structure. So let me just find the server that we are going to be using and the database. Now, one thing I would like to mention is that in this example, as you saw earlier, in the, uh, in, the, in the matrix of the orders and dimensions, um, we're going to be looking at sales information. And so in this example here right now with the tendency tracker, I'm going to be doing, um, I'm going to be going from the sales table to the dimension table, which is the country, the shipping country um, um, information. So let's start and see what I mean by that, because I know that the talking doesn't really help. So the first thing, I select the database, I select everything, I add into the project. Now, I have some sort of visibility over all of the tables and objects available in my database. Now, that, that's, you know, yes, very good. I can see the relation, but obviously that's not very useful. I can ch change the shape, obviously, to see if there's any more use on that. I can select the objects and see how they relate to each other. But then again, it's too much information in here. So what I'm going to do next, I know that I'm starting from the sales information. So I'm just going to type sales in here, and I find sales information. Now, in here on the right-hand side, I can see all of the objects that have something to do with the word sales. So I'm going to start from the sales order header table because I know that that's the table where all of the sales information is and I'm going to drive all of my way to um, the country information. So I've selected that table. So now I can invert that selection and remove from project and then let me reapply the layout. Now I have my one and only table as a starting point. I can expand and see all of the columns that are available within that table. And obviously in here I can see now uh, my ship to address. So most likely this is a relationship that is going to take me to the country. So then now I'm going to right click on this table, add to project, and object, this, <coughs> and object the, uh, the selection users. So now I can see all of the tables uh, that are directly related to my sales order header. I can change the layout to something that is more useful. I can um, I can zoom in and zoom out. So in this case, I'm going to go for the hierarchical because that's the one I actually prefer. Uh, and I can see now start discovering the tables that I need for finding my country dimension table. So again, I've got customer. I know that that's not the one. Credit card address. So now this is the table I'm after to see what if it actually takes me to the country information. So at least this one has say province ID, which is more likely to take me there. So, so I'm going to select this one and the sales order header. I'm going to invert selection and remove from project. And as you can see, I could repeat this process over and over until I actually find the path to, um, to my table, my dimension table, and also I have the whole relationship uh, between the table to the sales order header. So, Obviously, I did something from home, otherwise it would take a little bit longer. And if I go back here, I've already had my project done. And you can see all of the tables that are related in this example of today. And now, the good thing about this is I can have, I can print this out. I know the table names. I know how they relate to each other. I know what tables, what columns. So I have the information to explore the country table, but also I have all of the information that I need to for the joint um, for my query that is going to build up the fact table uh, in my data map. So at this stage, I think I'm ready to move on, aren't we, Tom? Yeah, it certainly looks that way to me. So, I mean, it, it's an excellent first step. We've already been able to uh, get a head start on understanding the source database and been able to identify how to get to the data that we actually need for our application. Um, so at this point, we need to make a decision on actually how we're going to implement our solution. Um, in this case today, we're actually going to adopt a design methodology where we're going to try and store the logic on the SQL server rather than as part of the BI package. Um, so let's have a quick look at, at what we mean by this. When we're creating our BI package and we come to extract some data from one of our SQL sources, we have a number of different options on how we can actually do this. Uh, we can make use of a SQL table or a view, we can call a stored procedure, or we can actually embed a, a SQL command as part of that BI package. Uh, the key point in adopting our approach is to not use embedded SQL commands and instead make use of more stored procedures as, as part of the database to retrieve our information. Uh, the result of this means that all of the SQL logic is now stored on the SQL server 
rather than being hidden away within the BI solution itself. The reason we do this is, well, there's, there's quite a few reasons, but the over overlying reason is the fact that it allows us uh, to make more use of, of tools traditionally available to SQL developers that we can actually use to work with the SQL code um, in our BI application. Um, so what are the benefits that this approach provides for us? Well, first of all, as with, um, with any uh, developer worth their salt really, we need to consider versioning and we need to look at actually getting our, our uh, object under source control. So um, once the logic is actually stored on a SQL server, we can make use of RedGate's tools to provide source control to database developers. Um, we can actually use those for our business intelligence objects. So source control is nothing new to application developers. It's something that's been around you know, for ages and ages. We're all aware of the benefits. Um, it's something that's been more welcomed by database developers since the introduction of the SQL source control tool, which makes it much more easy to actually manipulate the source control system. Um, and there's certainly no reason we see why this can't be passed on to business intelligence developers as well. So, um, so let's take a look at perhaps how we get this set up and started. Naomi, can, um, can we get started under source control? Yes, we can, and we should. So I'm going to go back to management studio. Let me just close my, <coughs> my window. OK, so back in management studio, the two databases that we're going to be using today is AdventureWorks BI, which is a copy of AdventureWorks that I'm going to be using for this project, and the other database which is going to play the role of the data warehouse and where the data mod is going to live is demo DW. So the first thing, let's take this, this database and hook it up to uh, source control. So we go to link database to source control. Uh, you have different options. Um, I think recently we also have some other options. Is that correct? Yes. Um, but for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to use evaluation. Please feel free to download the product and try it out. Again, it's free, so you can see if actually you can benefit from that. I'm going to use a dedicated database because I'm using an own copy. So I'm going to create um, my, my repository. I'm going to create that link. And now AdventureWorks BI is actually on source control. The same thing I'm going to do with demo DW. So again, link database to source control. Again, I'm going to use the evaluation of option only, create new, and I'm going to use whoa, this repository, create, dedicated database. Again, it's my own personal copy before deployment. I link. Now my two databases are also hooked into the, um, into source control. Now, as a starting point, if your database has never been into source control or um, well, yeah, it's the first time. Uh, you probably need to uh, commit all of the changes as a starting point from before you start your development. So that's what I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is actually commit my changes. So if I go commit changes to source control, all of the objects that are brand new in AdventureWorks BI because before it wasn't in source control are now here. So I'm just going to commit in here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And now I commit my changes. Okay, now it's done. So now I'm ready in the database layer. I'm already uh, I'm ready to actually start my work. The other thing that we also need to do, obviously, is open up this uh, business intelligence developer studio and get our project into um, source control. In this case, I haven't. We are not going to cover um, source control in this um, studio, but obviously, you will have already this type of tools uh, available to you. So now I've got my project in business intelligence development studio ready. I've got my tables ready. In source control, I think we're ready to start, Tom. Fantastic! It's um, it's great to know that everything's now sort of tucked away and, and safe in source control. I mean, of, of of course, there is to some degree um, some traditional methods of source control in your BI uh, packages, but the, the trouble with that approach is they're very much all or nothing. Um, you can either source control the package as a whole or, or not at all. So in this case, by actually using SQL source control, we're able to break that down into the individual components that are part of the, the SQL Server database. So each of our stored procedures that we're going to use later to extract the data is source controlled as a, as a single entity, uh, and we have a history for that object on, on its own. Um, so that's really one of the reasons why this approach is, is much more beneficial 
Um, and, and yeah, I, I think we're ready to move on. So, um, so I guess we've taken a look at discoverability. Um, obviously, versioning we've just done. So the next on our list was coding. Now, Naomi reliably tells me that when it comes to uh, uh, writing SQL in bids, there's actually very little to help. So there's, there's no IntelliSense, there's no dependencies suggested, uh, nothing. Um, but now that we're working within SQL Management Studio, because our logic is stored within the, uh, within the SQL Server, um, we actually have access to tools like uh, SQL Prompt and SQL Search, uh, which give us much more help when we're actually going ahead and writing our SQL. So we've got auto completion, join condition creation, column pickers, column level dependencies, and loads, loads more. So um, I, I, I can't build these things, but uh, Naomi, it's your job. Do you want to go ahead and, and get us started? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> if I go back, oh, you see, I'm already ready to release, Tom. If I go <laughs> to my PC, I can, I'm still thinking about that pint you owe me from that last week. Anyway, so if we I go know. back to our project, so the first thing we need to do is, I mean, and here what I'm going to cover is our path. From, so basically we're going to uh, export the dimension table, which is the country information. So how we do that? So the first thing we normally do is we come to uh, Business Intelligence Studio, and we most likely will create um, a package that will contain uh, the uh, transformation. So I'm going to open up my toolbox and get the uh, OLDB data source. And in here, I need to select the table. Now in here, my options are either I select the table, it could be an option if I already know what table, I have to actually browse through to find it, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm, you'll see as I said that I'm a little bit lazy developer, and I don't like to be browsing around three million tables until I find the one I need. But also, I like sometimes to add some logic in my export um, information, in my export um, job, so I can I, I do some more, um, um, oh, some more logic afterwards. You'll see what I mean in a second. So um, the country information would be here. I think this is the one. I could do this one. I can also do SQL command and type here my query. So I could do select and stuff or select whatever table. But as you can see, there is no intelligence in here. So I prefer to go to Management Studio and I'm going to do it from here. So the first thing I'm going to do, write a query. But again, I need to know the table name. And I I'm a lazy developer, so I'm going to take advantage of SQL search. SQL search will find the table for me. So I know it's country something, so I'm going to write country. All of the objects suddenly appear in here, so I'm going to filter by the table. Now I've got the country table that I was after. If I double click on it, automatically get selected in my object explorer. Now I can do select of thousands, and I've got my table. For this particular scenario, I'm going to use um, our business case. Have decided that we don't care if the country gets changed over time. So we, if the country gets changed, we're going to update it. So for that, I'm going to get rid of all of these um, comments. I'm going to get, I'm going to remove the top thousand, and I'm going to add in here a way of detecting that that row has changed. So I'm going to use checksum um, because I can use the logic um, in. Sorry, I can use the logic back in SQL Server and it's stored in here. So I'm going to use country name region uh, code, and I can also use name. You might not notice, but this is SQL Prompt, another of our products that can help you type um, the queries as you as you go. You will find it very useful. But I'm about to show you the best feature ever. You'll love this one. So if I go name, and then I'm going to call this as oh sorry, as hash. Now I've got my query. If I run it, I've got some. Sorry, a syntax mistake. So I run this, it runs fine, but I need it to look just perfect. And this, you know, you wouldn't believe how useful it is, this format SQL, every single time that you need to read SQL. But anyway, we have the query. Um, it's returning the information I need it to read, and it needs to return. So I have the option of typing it in here. If I did this, it's a perfect valid option. The problem is that no one knows that I'm using that table here. No one knows that I'm querying or manipulating anything here. So the best approach is actually creating an source block. So now I'm going to take advantage again of SQL prompt and encapsulate this as a new sort procedure. Now before I do that, I need to do some preparation. So if you bear with me for a second while I create the schema um, and some sort of for our scenario, 
Just bear with me for a second, please. This is so that we have a team of roles and we can differentiate the security levels uh, on, on our example. So let me just run this. One, two, three, done. Okay. So can I move this away? So I'm just going to close that up. So now I'm all ready. So I'm going to create, sorry, SQL prompt. So again, I select the, uh, the query, SQL prompt, encapsulate this as a new store procedure. Uh, the schema is um, cubed, so it's you know, easy detectable in our uh, adventure work database. Um, and then if we go into USP get country, and that's the name of the sub procedure. I click next, view is correct, now it's there. I can now select the correct database. I create the sub procedure. I can execute and oops, sorry. I can see that it returns the information I wanted to return. And now I can put that as sub procedure in here. When I do that, I can see that it returns the information. I've got the information there. But in the other hand, if I go back in here, I already see that my sub procedure is in um, source control and it's being modified so there are changes pending for committing. I also have the other changes that I did just to prepare for this example. So now if we continue in here, so the next step, this one obviously is get countries. The next thing would be to do a lookup. So I'm going to do a lookup in the destination table. So on the source table we'll have uh, uh, the country information. On the uh, destination table we'll have also the hash information. So we're going to do a lookup, so this one will redirect to no match output. Connections is going to be the demo database. <coughs> database. Um, and obviously, it doesn't exist the table yet, so we're going to create it. In this case, it's going to be called geo.country. So I've got the country table. Now it's going to give me an error because it cannot select it, but that's perfectly fine. That's the joy of this. Now I've got geo country selected in here. And now I'm going to map these two, um, the primary key of the table in here, and I'm going to export this one out, and I'm going to call this one as old. Now, on the next step, I'm going to say, okay, if you don't find on this destination table the, uh, <coughs> the uh, row, uh, this particular country, basically, um, I want you to insert brand new. So we're going to go and insert no match directly into the table. So no match output into the table and in here we're going to select from demo data warehouse and in this case because it's a very small table I'm just going to uh, select the table but you could use an insert a sort procedure where you could do some other um, logic in there make sure that the mappings are correct so now in here is insert new and now the next one we need a conditional split so now if I select the conditional split the two things that we need to do is, if it has been modified, updated. If it hasn't been modified, then do nothing. So we put the match in here and select columns. And we're going to compare the hash that is already on the table with the hash, sorry, the hash that is already on the table with the one that is coming from the data flow. So this is checked um, equal. And it is not equal. It's not equal. Okay, so now we have the two outputs available in there. So I'm going to use uh, the trash destination, which is available for free by SQL list. Um, it's very handy if you're trying to debug the uh, work, you know, where the data is actually going through the different paths. It's very handy if you have, a, you know, if you have nothing to do, also to have some destination that that data actually goes to. So if the checksum is equal, it's going to do nothing. It's going to go to trash. But if not, we're going to run an update command. So if I do, if I do this, I link the, con well, the condition is split to here. As you may know, if you run an OLSDB command before, you select uh, destination. But when you come in here, you have the most beautiful SQL command intelligence that you could ever experience, which is this. And as you can see, there is no help, nothing to aid you in here. So again, you can write your update command in here and say, you know, I want uh, to update in my demo something, something in here. Or you can use the sort procedure. Again, I've brought some of that stuff um, already made from home. So just bear with me. I'm just going to create that. Open. 
this is not the correct one. Sure. Sorry, bear with me. Ah, oh, it's already created. Sorry. Sorry for the quick changing of of, um, of the screens. I know that can be confusing when you're promoting. So I'm going to go to programmability, go to procedures, and this is the update country. So I've created that already in the, my preparation script. So if I just use the update command, if I go back to my project in business intelligence studio, and I use uh, the command straight away in here, I have to put question marks. But that means that when I come, when I go to the column mapping, all I have is param zero, param one, and param two, which is, as you might agree, not very uh, very useful if you have like 15 or 30 um, columns to be mapping. So for this matter, I'm going to use the sort procedure. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to put it in the command. So it's one, two, and three, so it's three parameters. I go to column mapping, and at least now I have the names that I can map on. I can map, obviously, through this, or I can map in here. I know that you still have to map one by one, but it's, I'm, I'm sure you can agree that uh, it's much better doing it this way than actually doing the parent. Now, I've got in here update row. So now I've got finished my little component here. So if I now execute this task, I should see all of the rows going straight away to here, which I do, because they didn't exist in the destination yet. If I run this again, all of the rows should go to the track destination because nothing has changed. If I go back to my management studio and I go to adventure web, as again, you know, you know, I'm, I'm lazy, let's find the country, country, and adventure web CI. There you go. So I double click and I'm going to edit the top hundred and I'm going to change Andorra for um, Andorra Republica. Republica. They might get sorry if there is anyone from Andorra here. It's not in service. Apologize in advance. So now I've changed the name of the country. If I change that and I go back to my development studio project, I execute the task again, I should see one coming down this path. So I've tested all of the possible paths in my package. I know everything is running as I expect. So now I've finished uh, programming everything I need for my little project. Um, obviously, I've got the rest of things here. I'm sorry it's not quite working because <clears throat> I didn't refresh it before. But you see the purpose of having this here. Now, if I go back to Management Studio, I can now commit my changes into source control. So I'm going, sorry, I'm just going to close a few windows so it's not too confusing. Bear with me for a second. Close. There we go. So now if I, I can do it through the window in here, but normally we'll go in here and commit changes to source control. <coughs> now for all of my store procedures, I've got my uh, a schema declare here. So I'm, I think I'm ready to release. So I'm going to put ready for release. So I can make my changes for adventure work. This is done. And I do the equivalent for demo data warehouse. So I'm going to go and commit changes to put control. And I'm ready for release. Yay! Commit. So I've got my package ready. I've got all of my data changes uh, already into source control. I think I'm ready for release because I've finished the bit that I needed to do. What do you think, Tom? I think I've finished? Hmm. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to agree with you. Um, mm, yes, I it's great. We've, we've got all the logic in place, so super. And yes, it would be lovely to come and have a beer with you. But I, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, we've touched on visibility a little bit, um, but at this point, I, what pops into my head is what, is what would happen now, though, if a SQL developer came along and, and decided to make a change to one of your objects, say the, the countries table, and, and, and change one of the columns, uh, perhaps country name or something. Where would that leave you? Surely that would, um, that would break your package. How, how would you be able to see what had happened? So that, that would make me very unhappy, and I would go <laughs> in panic mode. So I'm sure most of you that are hearing today um, have suffered from the problem that, you know, you have your package, it's been running fine, your cube's processed, everything refreshes as you expect, and then suddenly one day something breaks and you spend hours trying to find what the hell has happened in the source database that made everything else to break. Now, that 
again, that little panic button, I think I should I've pressed it in the past. The good thing about having source control is that you can see the changes. You can share uh, your repositories with uh, all the SQL developers. So if when they change, um, um, when they change, um, sorry, columns or objects or any details in the source database, they're already aware that your source procedure is there. So if I go back, sorry, I'm just going to change, going to show you what I mean, sorry. Um, so if we go back in here, if I made a change, if a developer made a change in this database and committed it, then we would be able to see the straight away in here because everything is in source control. So including my 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 source procedures here. So they would be able to tell that by depend you know by by looking at the dependencies, they will be able to tell that some other application is actually calling in here. And I would be able to identify that change much easier, much faster than I would I would have done all the while, I think. What do you think, Tom? Do you think that that's right? Okay, so so it makes it quite a lot clearer then um, for for first of all, I guess the SQL developers to see your objects um, mm. because they're stored on the SQL server. But because you're using SQL source control, uh, you can actually see the changes that uh, developers make to the objects as well. So it works both ways, I guess. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. Super. Okay then. Well, in that case, I I, I guess I can't not agree with you. Um, it's <laughs> it's time for release. Um, so uh, traditionally, this point is perhaps one of the more tedious parts where it's quite a manual, laborious process where we have to get all of our scripts ready, check all the changes that we've made, um, make sure we've got the creation scripts for all those new objects that Naomi has just created, pass those on to the release team, and, and, and really it, it's just very time consuming. Um, now, if any of you out there are familiar with Redgate, I'm sure you've uh, seen our SQL Compare tool before, um, but SQL Compare really makes this so simple uh, that it's, it's just a matter of a few clicks. Um, we can actually use the tool to compare our target and our source and create the scripts that we need to pass on to our release team. Uh, so Naomi, do you want to go ahead and finish up and, and create yep. those scripts? So this is the easy part. And so now we've made our changes, they are in source control. The next thing we can do, we just want to script our changes and deploy them and give them either to the test team or to, uh, to the deployment team. So if I right click in here, I can actually get a schema compare deployed and I'm going to set this one as the source database because obviously this copy here contains my changes, the ones that I've made. And in the other end, I'm going to drag and drop on Central Web. But in this case, I'm actually going to, cho to choose the first commit, commit that we did initially, you saw at the very beginning of the presentation. So in here, I'm going to commit to that, um, sorry, to compare to this one. Why am I comparing to this one? Because this is, let's assume that this one is actually the production version. The version is currently running on our production service. So we're going to go to compare and deploy with SQL compare. And now the program opens. And I'm going to compare them now. I click OK. Now in this window, I can see 148 objects have not changed. And in here are my seven objects that have changed. So all I have to do, I can click on them. I can see in here what they look like, what they, you know, what each sub procedure is. I can see if they look like what I, you know, I would expect for my release. But also I can then use my synchronization wizard and click next and now have all of the scripts for creating all of the store procedures and schema and anything that you have modified for this particular release in one go. So I can save this script <coughs> I can save this script to a file and I don't know let's let's call it sorry, wrong folder. So I'm just gonna call it um, I don't know, release, release version, I don't know, version, okay. Changes, okay, so now I've saved it there. I could open it straight away to, from here to the script editor. Unfortunately, even though I just did that, <laughs> my, my computer is a bit upset with um, SQL Server and different versions, so I apologize for that, being trialing things, so, um, but basically, you would have in here your um, sorry, your script that you can actually um, 
modify if you needed to, but basically all of your changes are now available in here. You're ready for release, very simple, in like three steps and you're ready to go. So we're ready to release and ready to for that time. Tom. Well, that, that, I mean, that's fantastic. We've, um, we've seen right from the initial investigation all the way through to the final deployment. And we've had help at, at every step of the way. Um, so we've had database and object discovery using uh, SQL dependency tracker and SQL search. We've been able to safeguard our work using SQL source control. Uh, SQL prompt and SQL search have assisted us in actually creating our, um, our, our package creating the SQL code required for our package. And visibility as a whole has been improved by, use, by storing that logic on the SQL server and by use of SQL source control. And then finally, as, as we just saw, the scripts for deployment have been created using SQL compare in, in just a few steps. So that, that really covers our, uh, our five areas, discoverability, versioning, coding, visibility, and deployment. And all of the tools that we've used today are actually available as part of the SQL developer bundle. For, um, for all of you who have attended uh, this webinar today, thanks very much for your time. Uh, we do have a special offer for you, so if you contact Michael Christofides, um, his email address is on the screen there, and quote the code BI webinar April 11, um, we can actually offer you a $200 discount off of a license of our SQL Developer Bundle. Um, but uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to go ahead and download the free trials, you can do, please uh, head over to redgate.com where you can get a 14 day trial of all the tools. Our SQL source control tool, in fact, is a, is a 28 day trial. So, um, so really that, that brings us to the end. Thanks, thanks again for your time. And um, if there's any questions, please do type them into the uh, panel on your GoToMeeting uh, applet there. And, um, and Michael, if, if you could read them out and um, we'll see what, what people want to know. Well, thank you very much, Tom and Naomi, for um, a, a brilliant demo there. Um, so, as, um, as Tom said, if you do have any questions, do please type them in. So, no, now is the time where we're going to throw open the floor. Um, so, we have quite a few questions already. Um, first one is from Paul Williams, who's asking, what if the tables in a database don't have uh, PKSK relationships? Can SQL dependency track and match relationships based upon name or similar? Tom, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I, I think in that instance, it would it would actually be uh, more beneficial to us to use the approach that Noemi showed us using SQL Search to actually trace those relationships. Um, where where the primary key foreign key relationships don't exist, then perhaps the the method that we showed using SQL track would not. <laughs> I'm sorry about that everyone, we, we seem to have lost Tom again, um, so um, um, when Tom's back we can carry on with the answer to that one. Um, so the next question is from Michael uh, Sikoris, who's also asking about dependency tracker, um, asking if it would work if the source system was not SQL Server based. Also in this case, you may stage the data without redefining the table relationships. Would this then be useful? So dependency tracker is uh, just working with SQL Server databases currently and it's actually just a view, so kind of like a read-only, um, and it does use the primary key and foreign key relationships to graph out the dependencies between the tables. So this is actually a view into the current state of the database. Um, you wouldn't be redefining relationships at this point. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Um, so the next question is from uh, Robert Carlson, who is asking, um, Again, about SQL dependency tracker, will it automatically connect different tables as long as the key name between them is the same? Um, good question. So again, it's using the foreign key relationships that are defined in the database to track the dependencies between the tables. I mean, in that case, if, you, if, they was, if there wasn't any relationship between the, um, the two tables, the only thing is the table name, I would suggest using SQL search for finding all the tables that actually use the same uh, name in all the columns if there is no relationship between them, and it's quite, it's quite handy. 
Thank you. And the next question from Gail Schiffer is asking, um, does source control include data? Um, so yes, Gail, it does um, include static data. Next question from Gary Carty, who's asking if the webinar is going to be available um, as a recording. So yes, um, everybody who's registered today will be emailed a, a link to the recording. Um, that should come out either uh, tomorrow or the following day. Okay, and the next question from Andrew Jackson, who's asking, how about changes that drop or alter columns or require tables to be dropped and then recreated? Thanks, Andrew. So um, in SQL Source Control, we are storing the creation script for each object, so you can see how the changes, um, how each object changes over time. So we have history at the database level, but we also have history at an object level. So when you get the latest version in SQL Source Control, or when you deploy those changes uh, using SQL Compare, um, SQL Compare actually generates um, the author script. So in most cases, it won't have to um, you drop your table. If the table ne needs to be dropped and recreated, the, the table data would actually be transferred alongside. Um, there are a few situations that um, you may need to alter the script yourself. So for instance, if, um, if you wanted to add a not null column to a table and the table already has some records in it, you may need to um, insert some data into that, or you would need to provide a default value so that records that are already in that table um, get populated. We do warn you, if you do um, change the data type, so let's say you're going from um, an int to a tiny int, um, we will give you a warning when you do the SQL comparison that that could result in data loss. Um, so you do get a warning for, for changes to your data types like that. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, another question from Andrew Jackson is asking about SQL Compare. Um, so Andrew is asking, how about changes that drop or alter columns or require tables to be dropped and then recreated? So that's actually kind of the, the same um, answer because SQL Source Control is using the SQL Compare engine behind the scenes. So anything that the, uh, SQL Source Control uh, is handling, um, SQL Compare will handle it the same way. So again, um, in SQL Compare, you get warnings if you're truncating, um, you know, uh, or you could truncate a column based on making a data type smaller. So if you're going from like a var car 50 down to a var car 25, you would get that warning. Thank you. Um, so we have a question about SQL Dependency Tracker, um, if, it, if it's available for download. So yes, if you go to reggae.com, um, there's a 14-day free trial on there that you can download. Um, so next question is, um, sorry, I just skipped it there by mistake. Um, what if the source database is SQL Server 2000 and SQL Search does not help and the relationships are not defined? I'm attempting to build a data warehouse in SQL 2008. Very interesting question. Um, I would really like to hear your thoughts on that. I've, I've come across a different ways of approaching that, uh, a specific way of exporting uh, information out of um, SQL 2000. Um, if you could um, uh, drop us an email, I mean, if you drop an email to Microsoft Office and then forward the question, I'll be happy to answer outside of the scope of this um, uh, webinar. And I'll, I'll be very interested in hearing what your thoughts are in that area. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so next question from Vincent. Ropoli, um, who's asking if you can specify a project slash subfolder within TFS when using SQL source control, or, or does the application use the database name for the project folder? So yeah, in TFS you can set up any repository structure that you would like. Um, it can have a, you know, a project with subfolders and then under that subfolder have a, a database folder. And then when you link your database to source control, you just specify uh, the existing empty folder in TFS that you want to link to. So you can set up your structure however you would like in TFS and then just link to that specific folder you're interested in um, putting your database schema and your static data under. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so, um, so, so Andrew Jackson's asking again about SQL compare. Um, so sorry for the confusion earlier, Andrew. Um, so he's asking about how about changes um, this is regarding SQL Compare that drop or alter columns or require tables to be dropped and then recreated. 
Thanks, Andrew. Um, actually, I'd love to follow up with you on this after, because we're actually looking into um, a solution for this right now. Um, so because SQL Compare does, uh, is comparing the state of your database at two points, if you renamed a column, it might think, it, it would think that it's dropping and adding a new column. So we're actually currently uh, designing how to resolve this. But again, you do have the ability to um, edit the synchronization script before you actually run it. So um, you need to be aware about what changes you're running, um, especially if it's a production database. Uh, you know, if there was a way to go to a test server or a staging server uh, before running it on your production database would be what we would recommend. Thanks, Stephanie. And so the next question from Ganesh Murthy asking, does dependency tracker help to fine-tune complex store procedures? How dependency tracker help to fine tune? Um, I think dependency tracker might not be actually the best tool for tuning complex store procedures. What dependency tracker would help you with is actually finding them and know the relationship between um, the tables and, um, and the different objects within the database. Um, if you wanted to fine tune uh, complex store procedures, I would probably recommend. Um, all the tools um, that we might have, uh, I don't know, SQL, SQL, sorry, SQL Pros actually might be a way of making it more visible and actually more readable. Uh, it might help you detect things that you don't really want to be doing um, at that, that level. Um, and then obviously you have uh, tools that Microsoft offers like um, a tuning advice and to have uh, yeah, tuning advice is something something along the lines. I mean, if you're having issues with a specific complex tool procedure, we'll be happy um, happy to hear from it, and, and we might even um, be able to help you and, and try to, uh, to tune it if you want. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so, uh, next question is again about SQL Compare from Juan Zavala, who's asking, when using SQL Compare, can you overwrite target objects from a source, especially if it's a staging database target? So yeah, in SQL Compare, you um, can see the comparison results, and then you can specify which objects that you want to synchronize. Um, so it's actually going to um, create an alter statement if you actually want it to completely get rid of something in the uh, target. If it's in an existing source, then it would drop it. But if you, um, you know, if if the object actually did exist in the target then it would generate an author script. So it's going to push any of the changes in your source database and apply them to your target database. Um, if you need it to um, get rid of something in your target database, then you would need to, uh, if it wasn't in your source database, then it would actually drop it. Um, but it, yeah, I think I think the, the whole idea behind SQL Compare is to be able to compare two databases and then synchronize to so anything that's defined in your source be able to push that or migrate that up to a staging database. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so, so Tom's back, and we were um, um, talking about the um, dependency tracker. Um, so, Tom, is what, yeah. what if tables in a database don't have uh, PKFK relationships? Can SQL dependency tracker match relationships based upon name or similar? So, um, so I think we've we've kind of uh, sort of covered this previously. I think Stephanie. Uh, touched upon it. Um, it's not something that SQL Dependency Tracker will be able to help you with, um, but by using different approaches such as uh, using things like SQL Search and um, looking at the actual columns of the different tables within the database, you can actually track through uh, much more easily than actually doing it by hand and just rolling through uh, through each of the objects. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and we have one more question um, asking about what source control systems that does SQL source control support. Do you want to get Thanks. on, Oh, Tom? Stephanie, go ahead. Great. So um, we support Subversion, Team Foundation Server, Vault, and Vault Pro. We also support Bazaar, CVS, Git, Mercurial, and Perforce. We also, um, in our latest release, we have an option that you can integrate with any source control system that has a command line. Um, we have already had some users set up command line integration with AccuRev. So if you are using a source control system that has a command line, 
uh, you should be able to link to that system as well. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and we just have one more question um, about how easy is SQL source control to evaluate? Okay, so, um, so I think we saw within the, the demonstration there that SQL Source Control actually comes with a built-in evaluation repository option. Um, so it, it's pretty much one of the easiest things to evaluate because you can actually just install it, not have to worry about setting up your own source control environment beforehand. Use the uh, evaluation repository. You've got 28 days to see how it works for you. Um, and then if, if, if you're keen, um, then you can worry about actually setting up the environment later. Thanks, Tom. Um, so that, that's all the questions we have at the moment. Um, so just before we wrap up, if anyone has any more, please do type them in. Or, or if you think of one after the event, um, you can email us on the email address on the last slide, uh, michael.christifides at redgate.com. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for attending today or if you're listening to the recording. Um, and thank you to Tom and Naomi for um, a very good presentation and demo. Um, Thanks, Michael. Um, there's been some feedback, people are saying it's awesome. Um, oh, sorry, we have one more question from Andrew Jackson who's asking, um, does SQL Source Control support tasks in TFS? So, yes, actually, uh, TFS has a concept of work items. So, work items could be stories or tasks or bugs. And in uh, SQL Source Control, if you um, are doing a piece of work, so let's say there was a bug assigned to you that was a work item ID number one, two, three, um, and it impacted you know, a stored procedure, so you had to make a change to a stored procedure. When you committed that, you could just say pound A123 to associate that commit to that bug, or you could say pound R123, which would resolve that particular work item, that bug, with the commit you changed. So it's a really great way to track, um, you know, if, if there's bugs or if there's tasks, what changes to the code have to be made and track that all within source control. So that's for team foundation server, but also for subversion, there's a way to link it to other bug, track, bug tracking systems like JIRA. Um, and there's also in Vault Pro also has a similar concept of work items, um, and you can link specific database commits to those work items so you can track uh, what changes needed to be done to fix those bugs. Okay, thank you very much everybody. Um, so, um, oh sorry, one last question. Do you know Source Control works with MKS Integrity Suite? Um, thanks Nicholas. Um, actually that's one I haven't heard of, um, but again if it has a command line, then you should be able to uh, just specify a few parameters in a file that comes with SQL Source Control. Um, so as long as it has a command line, then you should be able to link SQL Source Control with MKS. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, follow up with support at redgate.com afterwards, and they might be able to help, um, help with that. Okay. Um, well, well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so, just to reiterate the next steps, if you want, if you're interested in investigating this further, so all the tools shown today are available in the SQL Developer Bundle. Um, there's a $200 um, off offer for everybody who either attended live or is viewing this recording. Um, we do have more webinars coming up, so um, if you go to regate.com under the SQL Source Control product, um, you'll see a list of all the forthcoming webinars. Um, and also we have free trials of all of our tools, so they're fully functional, most are 14 days and one or two are 28 days. Again, all available on the website. So um, thank you very much everybody and I hope to speak to you on a future webinar. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.